Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome back to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. I'm so glad you're with me today. This is episode number 94. Now, what does that mean? That means we are six episodes away from the magic number 100. I never thought we would get to 100. I never thought we'd get past 10, to be candid. Uh, I started this podcast about two and a half, three years ago, kind of on a lark. I I just thought, well, we haven't done podcasts before. We've done many other uh, types of, of communication mediums, but we've never really concentrated on podcasts. Let's give it a shot and see what it's all about. And I thought we'd do five or 10 episodes and then we'd move on to whatever the next popular medium would be. Uh, Well, it turns out this is a popular medium. And uh, this is episode, as I said, number 94. And we're six episodes away from number 100. So we're going to celebrate episode 100 a little bit differently than we, uh, as an episode, than our normal episodes. And that is number 100 will be live. Normally I pre-record these and fix all the mistakes that I, that I make. So it comes out a little bit more seamless, but we're going to go live on uh, July 26th. That will be our 100th episode. So it'll be live on Facebook, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Um, so I'll be sending out information on how you can view that uh, 100th episode live on July 26th uh, in uh, the upcoming uh, days and weeks. I'll be sending that information out. Uh, In the meantime, let's get on with this episode. Uh, Dr. Ron Lasky is my guest today. Dr. Ron Lasky is a senior technologist at Indium Corporation, as well as a professor of engineering at Dartmouth College, where I have twice had the privilege of speaking to uh, Dartmouth students on the Dartmouth campus. If you're like some people who view the next generation of young adults skeptically and perhaps pessimistically, I can assure you that your view would quickly change after spending any amount of time with his students. Dr. Lasky has more than 30 years of experience in electronics and optoelectronics packaging at IBM, Universal Instruments, and Cookson Electronics. Additionally, he served as an adjunct professor at several colleges, teaching more than 20 different courses on topics ranging from electronics packaging, material science, physics, mechanical engineering, and science, and religion. Dr. Lasky holds numerous patent disclosures and is the developer of several SMT processing software products relating to cost estimating, line balancing, and process optimization, all subjects of paramount paramount importance uh, in today's hyper-competitive environment. He is the co-creator of engineering certification exams that set standards for the electronic assembly industry worldwide. Dr. Lasky was awarded the Surface Mount Technology Association's Technical Distinction Award in 2021 for his, quote, significant and continuing technical contributions to the SMTA. He was also awarded the SMTA's Founders Award in 2003. Dr. Lasky holds four degrees, including a PhD from Cornell University in Materials Science and is a licensed professional engineer. He has authored six books and contributed to nine more on science, electronics, and optoelectronics, and has authored numerous technical papers. And today, I'm going to be talking with Ron about some of those books. So without any further ado, let me bring in Ron Lasky. Hi, Ron. That was a a long intro, but your your work experience and your education uh, and your accomplishments, they just kind of produce a long intro. um, Yeah, thank you. We almost need a show just to describe you, <laughs> man of many talents. Uh, well, welcome back to Reliability Matters. This is your second Thank appearance, you. I believe, mm-hmm. on this show. Yep. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, perhaps before we, we get started, this is, I feel a little bit like this is going to be like the Oprah Book of the Month Club or something, um, yep. you know, suggested reading. Uh, but, uh, but before we get into that, let's uh, remind our audience how you and I got to know each other. Um, we, we've known of each other for years because both of us have been uh, roaming around this industry for, for uh, several decades, I believe. Um, yeah. But we, we got to know each other a little bit better uh, in 2019 when both of us were in Hawaii for the uh, Pan Pacific uh, Microelectronics Symposium, PANPAC. Yeah. 
Um, I was uh, second in line, a very long line to eat breakfast, to be seated. And I looked over my shoulder behind me and I saw you about 10, 15 people back, probably a good 20 minute wait for you to get up to the front of the line. So I'm like, Hey Ron, come, you know, if you're by yourself, just come join me. I'm by myself and get a table for two instead of a table for one. And then we got to talk and, and, um, I shared a little bit of my story, you, yours, um, next thing you know, you invited me out to uh, Dartmouth to speak to your students, which was yeah. absolutely awesome. It's an awesome campus, uh, beautiful mm-hmm. campus. And, um, uh, and the students were um, inspiring me, hope, <laughs> probably way more than I inspired them. Uh, and, uh, and now I've had the privilege of doing that twice. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it, it's an awesome experience. As I said in the intro, um, any negative view or pessimistic view one might, one older generation typically has for the younger generation is, is certainly put to rest uh, when we get to sit down uh, and talk with these um, young adults. Uh, they are yeah, our future, yeah. and yeah. and um, I envy your job as being able to, um, you know, work with them and help mold their their uh, professional life and and their education the way you do. So thank you. Let's get into. Let's get into some books, uh, shall okay. we? Uh, there are a number of, of books that you've had your hand on, either either you've written or you've co-written or, or uh, you've inspired. And uh, let's start with, uh, with this one, The uh, Handbook of Electronic Assembly. Now, this book was a predecessor to another activity you were involved in. Uh, why don't you uh, explain to me and, and uh, my audience what brought you to... Uh, uh, co-write this this particular book well um phil zaro and and jim hall and i uh, developed the um, smta certification program and one of the things we that became clear is there there are many books written about smt assembly but there really isn't a a handbook that tells somebody relatively new to the industry the basics of how to do electronic assembly you know how to how to set up a sprint printer how to design a, a stencil how does wave soldering work and so uh, Jim Hall and I mostly took the lead in writing it, and we used the material from the SMTA um, certification course to develop a book that you can actually read instead of just looking at the slides and, and pretty much on your own learn it. And I've actually used it at Dartmouth uh, for a few self-study courses. I've had some students say, you know, Professor, I need one more course. You have something practical that I could do. So I give them the book and let them read it and and i actually give them an exam at the end and uh it's you know really rewarding to see someone that doesn't know anything about electronic assembly probably be ready to go out into the world and and uh, be as good as anybody and the the tell me what led to the actual certification course we're going to talk about the book a little bit more but the book was you know obviously um kind of an after i'll say an afterthought like it was an accident but it was it you know, once you've developed the course, you decided to memorialize some of that information uh, in, mm-hmm. in, in the book. What was the inspiration for the course? Uh, SMTA, up to that point, had not been known as a trade organization that provided certifications. Uh, mm-hmm. SMTA, up to that point, sure. did a lot of other things, uh, education-wise, um, uh, symposiums and technical conferences and educational material and and papers and things like that. Um, what made you uh, and your colleagues come up with the, the pitch uh, okay. to SMTA to, to create a course? And, and I, I guess this is probably a story I I've, I've haven't told many people. So uh, before 9-11, I was working at Cookson Electronics, and um, we, had, we had thought of developing something like this, and, and we're sort of beginning to, you know, develop it. And then 9-11 happened, and the part of Cookson Electronics that I was in uh, just about went out of business. So I got laid off at, at, uh, uh, right after 9-11 and uh, uh, ended up, uh, uh, that's when I became a professor at Dartmouth and started working with the wonderful folks at um, Indian Corporation. And I, I, I knew Phil Zaro pretty well. I'm not sure I had met Jim Hall yet. So I called him up and I said, you know, we had this idea at Cookson Electronics. We didn't really have time to, when I was there, to bring it to fruition. And so why don't we get together? And, and I thought the three of us could, could develop the course. So we, uh, we, we got that idea. And then we met, I think you remember Joanne Stromberg. She used to be the, yeah. And so we, we met with Joanne and 
see if she thought it was a good idea. So then we met with the the board of uh, SMTA, and um, we we I was pretty impressed how quickly we developed. We developed it in less than a year, and and we had the inauguration of the first workshops in uh, SMTAI in 2002. So it'll be 20 years in 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 this fall, and. Uh, one of the reasons we thought about it is uh, the, the combination of Phil and I and Jim have probably been in more than 100 factories worldwide. And we just find that most folks that are professionals that get a job and, and work at a company, there isn't any any source they can go to to learn how to really do the basics. So um, the certification process actually starts with a day and a half of extremely intense teaching assuming that the people coming there have some reasonable amount of experience. We, we don't recommend anybody take it unless they've worked as a SMT assembly professional for six months. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. What's the yeah. kind of recommended entry requirement? It, it's obviously a little bit more than a 101 course. Is yeah. it as high as a 201 or higher, or is it uh, well, well, uh, intermediate? We, we sort of we suggest that it would be intended for someone that has at least a two-year degree technical degree, degree, like an associate's degree or equivalent, and something like at least six months of practical experience. Uh, realistically, what we usually find is uh, a number of folks that come uh, really need a lot of coaching during the, the teaching part, and uh, especially with the mathematics. It's not super difficult mathematics, but there's some algebra and sort of like calculating costs and things like that of assembling something. And um, that's, that's usually where people struggle a bit. But, um, you know, I should know this exactly, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guesstimate that more than 90% of people pass it. So it's, it's, got a, it's got a pretty good success rate. And I'd say with people that have a bachelor's degree, like in mechanical engineering, I, I'd say that um, it's pretty unusual that someone with that background will not, not pass. Are there, do you see a trend in the students that take this course in things they come into the course with that are just wrong and need to be reprogrammed. Is there, does that, does that degree of reprogramming change over the years or is there a consistent, um, you know, fallacy or myth or, you know, that you have to bust and, and reprogram? Well, well usually um, we, and I know it's going to sound a little negative, but we assume that people really don't have much background because we find that uh, we'll be in a class and, and we'll be talking about sack solder. And um, we find out that, that, you know, out of 20 people, three or four don't really know that sack stands for tin, silver, copper. And so we, we pretty much cover everything, but you know, our anticipation is that something like that, most people would know. And um, uh, sadly it's, it's a little surprising sometimes uh, people that even work, quite a while in the, in the industry, uh, I guess, just aren't curious. Uh, you know, and that's a particular one. If, if I say SAC 305, they don't know that that's 3% silver, 0.5% copper, and the balance 10. Right. It's SAC 305. Be, that's all it is. Yeah, it's just yeah, SAC yeah, 305, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I remember when I first got into this industry in 1985, I was just raw. I had never worked in the yeah. electronics industry before. I came from yeah. a completely different industry. Um, yeah. So one of the, you know, back in the days when we actually had paper magazines, you know, to read mm -hmm. before the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember one of the most valuable assets printed in the back of this magazine. And probably they had an extra ad page they didn't sell. So they, mm -hmm. they threw this in there. It was just a glossary of acronyms, acronyms for sure. our industry. Because sure. we are an ac yep. acronym-rich industry, you know, yep. um, SMTA, uh, yep. IPC. You know, everything is an acronym. And Here, um, Here's one you may get a, a kick out of. I've yeah. even seen people that uh, are senior professionals. They don't know the technical difference because there is one between a PWB and a PCB. Printed wiring printed board, wiring printed circuit board. board. Yeah, right. printed circuit board. The printed wiring board is before you assemble the circuits on it. Yes. So after it's assembled, it's a printed circuit board. Right, so, right. Um, yeah, printed circuit assembly versus printed circuit yeah. board, you know, before or after yeah. reflow, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I find those very helpful. And like so many people, you know, I, I suffered a little bit of imposter syndrome when I first came into this industry. I felt like, you know, no one realizes I snuck in the back door and I don't know anything, right? Ah, so, yeah, yeah, so um, yeah. 
it, it was very helpful to learn the acronyms because you start sure. throwing around some acronyms sure. and all of a sudden people go, oh yeah, yeah, that person's one of us. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, and I would, I would say to anybody new in the industry that, you know, wants to get maybe a year of experience before they, they take the program, um, just be curious, you know, pick up that jar of solder and ask yourself, well, what does SAC stand for? And what does the 305 stand for? And, and in your daily job, always be curious asking questions. Yeah. Uh, and, and you'll be, you'll be well prepared in a, in a year of experience if you do that. Yeah. I think what helped me is I, I'm of a curious mind anyway. I used to get into yeah. trouble when I was a, a small, well, when I was sure. a child, because I used to take apart my parents' clock radios and television sets and, and sure. anything electronic transistor radios, um, to figure out how they worked or at least to see what was behind the, the cover. Um, the reason I got in trouble is I didn't have as much interest in putting everything back. <laughs> so there would be this yeah, sure. <laughs> pieces yeah. of, of, right. of stuff everywhere. Um, but mm -hmm. I think um, Steve Jobs actually gave a commencement address where I think he said something to the equivalent of, you know, uh, stay curious, always be curious, yes. you know, always, right. always learn. Uh, sure. And, you know, modern internet technology has made it so much easier to learn, you know, no, we sure, might not be learning absolutely. things accurately because the internet is filled mm -hmm. with as much misinformation as valid information, but still we sure. have the ability to reach out and, and, and learn a whole lot easier than my parents' old um, annual subscriptions to the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? That was right. That's right. quite absolutely. limited yeah. learning. Yeah. Uh, sure. So the book, which came out of uh, the Handbook of Electronic Assembly, a guide to the SMTA certification, and that book is available, I should say, through the SMTA bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, it's two hundred. Uh, no, that's another book. It's 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 a, a beefy book, as I as I recall. Yeah. Um, that came out of the certification course. Do you recommend that people read that book before taking the certification oh, that, course, that would, or is that, that would be that would be so helpful if if you could read that and and only retain even sixty percent of it especially in areas where you don't know things, it would make it so e much easier to take the, take the test. Um, you know, as an example, maybe you're really into SMT assembly, but you've never even seen a wave solder machine. Well, you know, that's part of the course and we feel that's important. So it, it, there's enough detail that uh, you should be able to do everything on the exam. If you, if you, you know, all of the material, know all the material of the book, but I think it would be really helpful. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's go on to another book, uh, and that would be uh, this one right here, the sure. uh, Printed Circuit Assembler's Guide to Solder Defects. Now, you and uh, Christopher Nash wrote that book. Christopher's with Indium uh, as well, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, sure. All right. Yep. Um, what's that book? I love books about, and I love trainings about what goes wrong. You know, I love sure. to do, sure. whenever I interview a guest, um, a subject matter expert in any specific subject, I always ask what, what do your customers do wrong? Uh, because I find uh, teaching right. is a lot more effective on not, you know, not necessarily how to do it right, but, but here is what not to do. Right. Sure. Um, sure. I, uh, I wrote a book on, on my journey as, as an entrepreneur and, and basically the book is filled with everything I did wrong, not do what I yeah, do, yeah. do what I did, but do, don't do what I did. Right. Because I think, Negative reinforcement sometimes is more effective than positive reinforcement, yeah. at least in this I, context. I, you know, to, to support you, I, I've, of course, seen your talk when you came to Dartmouth. It, it is so helpful to the students to, to see the experience you went through and exactly what you're saying. You know, a lot, you learn a lot from the things you, you do wrong. I think somebody even said you don't learn anything from the things you do right, right? <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, I, if I were to be interviewing, you know, two people and you know, for a, a key position in my company. And, and one has had a, a trail of successes, never had a failure. And the other has had a, fail, a mixture of failures and successes. I would always go for the failure and success person yeah, because yeah, I, I don't know if some, you know, you can go sit at a roulette table in Vegas or Atlantic City and you could win 20 hands in a row. Does that mean you're a good gambler or does that mean that luck yeah. was on your side? Yeah, Probably right. the right. latter. Um, right. So I don't know if a person's never experienced failure, I don't know if they've just been lucky or if they're truly talented. And sure. I would rather go with someone that's fallen down a few times and has learned, mm -hmm. I'll never do that again. You know, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll fall other times, but they'll never repeat that mistake and know sure. that the mistakes are out of them before they come on my team. Uh, that would be, that would be good. So uh, let's talk about the book. What was the inspiration for this book? Well, one of the things that uh, myself and my colleagues at Indian Corporation, like Chris Nash, uh, there are a lot of defects out there and, and 
companies like Indium Corporation that make materials uh, for electronics assembly like solder paste really have a lot of experience in solving them because in some respects, almost every day they get customers calling, help us with this problem, help us with that problem. So we felt, Chris and I and some of the other folks at Indium Corporation, that, that we had a, a pretty good amount of knowledge in this and you can't just go to one place and learn how to solve the most common uh, defects in electronic assembly. So we said, well, why don't we put together a, a, a booklet? And um, it, it is a free booklet, by the way. As a matter of fact, the only of the three books we're going to talk about my book, the only one that is you have to pay for is the SMT certification. And it's I don't think it's super expensive, like $50. So, so Chris and I did this over a period uh, during the COVID time. And, um, you know, I, I think it would be very helpful, again, free, uh, even if you don't have these problems yet, to, to pick the book up. I think it's about 60 pages and, and, and know what causes voiding or, you know, what causes uh, head and pillow defects. So if they ever do happen to you, you've got kind of a leg up. Or maybe if you're developing a new process to uh, know beforehand the things that you can do that will minimize uh, any of these defects happening. And for my viewers and listeners, if you want to get a hold of that book, um, it's available at Indium. And I will put a link to the um, part of the Indium website where that book can be found um, in our show notes. So if you're on uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, just look down where it says show more and you'll see a link to that. And if you're on um, if you're on an audio only version, like on uh, Apple uh, podcast or Google podcast or Spotify or Amazon music, wherever you're listening, uh, look at the show notes and that'll be there as well. Uh, what are, uh, there was a time on the show when I thought we would never stop talking about voiding. <laughs> that was just the, yeah. the, 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 the conventional wisdom defect of the, of the year, you know, for, for many years. Um, and I had two sets of experts, two experts fell into one of two categories, either those that said voiding is overrated, it's not as big a problem as people think, you only need a small percentage of contact in most cases anyway, and we're just making, it's a red herring. And then those that were, you know, the opposite of that, like, no, 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 we really need to go toward 100%, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, contact and, you know, as close to 0% voiding as possible. So I've had both opinions uh, on this show, and, and probably both are valid depending upon the application, yeah. right? Yeah, um, sure. It's, it's not just, obviously, it's not just uh, electrical contact, it's heat dissipation and, and all that mm -hmm. stuff, which could be very important. Uh, what, is voiding still the, the poster child of solder defects, uh, or has that morphed over the years that we've been soldering? I, I think it is. Uh, Any corporation did a non-scientific survey, it's got to be at least 10 years ago, and, and you know, concluded that that was the, the number one defect concern. And I, I think that's still true because we haven't really completely got bulletproof techniques to completely get rid of it. I think we can dramatically minimize it. Um, I, I guess I should correct that. I think if you're willing to use a, a vacuum reflow oven, you can get it down to probably a, a percent or two. But uh, in, in the book, we also discuss, uh, and I've written some papers on it. I think I presented one at SMT PanPAC this year, SMTA PanPAC, uh, where even without a vacuum oven, you can uh, consistently get down to you know, le certainly less than 20%. And I, I think most people agree if you're something like less than 20% of the area of voiding in a, uh, the thermal pad of a, a bottom terminated component, you're in pretty good shape. Now you, one of your many uh, occupations is, you know, you're, you're a, a senior technologist at Indium. Indium is a material mm -hmm. supplier, um, solder mm -hmm. paste and metals, things like that, and fluxes, um, among other things. How much of solder defects falls on the material selection process or lack thereof, and how much uh, solder defect issues fall on process? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's a kind of a tough question to answer. The, the thing I can say is that uh, companies like Indium Corporation have, have studied a lot of these defects and have made their products such that they minimize them. In other words, if you're having the head and pillow defect, uh, there are things in your process that you can do to minimize that. Although Indian Corporation, and, and you know, to be fair, they're worthy competitors, some of them, ha have developed solder paste that, that minimize this effect with, without having to change the process. They're just more robust to minimizing the head and pillow defect. But, you know, assembly is an optimization process, and you can't make everything better by a change. So you might minimize the head and pillow defect and have other concerns. So... Typically, what we do 
is we try to work with our customers and, and tell them what we think are the, the, the better of our materials to minimize a certain defect, but also work on the process. Because there are certainly things in the process that you can you can do that will help to minimize uh, the, the different defects. And just like voiding, uh, we have solder paste that really perform very well in voiding, but we'll also tell you the four or five or six things you can do in your process to minimize it, like the right type of uh, stencil aperture uh, to have and the right type of reflow process to have to minimize voiding. So it sounds like the, the most correct answer to the original question, is it materials or process, is yes. <laughs> Both, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You have to have but, the right materials know, this is, this, using the right process. This is one of the things I was going to encourage everybody. I mean, uh, I'd be thrilled to have you get the defects booklet and read it and everything. But one of the things to remember, if you do start having some sort of defects, the people that work at, at your materials and equipment suppliers, they, they, they deal with these defects a lot. So one of the first things I would do is, is call up my material supplier or my equipment supplier. And, and I'm sure you have that in your world too, where uh, you can often help the people a lot and save them an awful lot of time. Because when you look at some of the technical people at, at companies like Indian Corporation or your company, or um, they're often dealing with, with defects from their customers almost every day and helping their customers. So they have an awful lot of knowledge that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find in a person that works in an assembly company because they haven't right. seen, you know, all the different flavors of defects because they're only one company. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, the, the big buzzword right now that I'm hearing is, you know, low temperature solder, LTS, low temperature solder. Yes. I was talking about low temperature solder. Um, when, a, not necessarily new technology, but when a technology becomes popular uh, like, mm -hmm. and, and trendy, like low temperature solder is at the moment, does that come at a cost of other defects? In other words, uh, does low temperature solder have any effect on voiding, uh, positive or negative, or does it have other effects that then have to be mitigated? Uh, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure we know enough yet about low temperature solders because I don't think they've really been you know, out there that long. Um, one of the things, especially if it's a business, bismuth-based solder is it's really hard to get the kind of reliability you get with a with a sack based solder, uh, especially in drop shock because and, and things have been done to make them better. I, I want to say make sure I say that and and in many cases you can get very good results, but uh, you won't get as good drop shock resistance with a uh, most of the business bismuth based low temperature solders. Uh, that's why s some companies like and I'm not sure you're aware of this Indian Corporation has developed a a, a, a sack based solder that uh, you can reflow at temperatures more like a little over 200 C, maybe 210, 220, instead of, you know, most sacks already have to take up to about 240 to make sure you melt it. And there, there's one, um, you know, and I promised myself I wouldn't make this too much of an advertorial, but uh, Indium uh, has, has a, a new solder paste called Durafuse that it's much more close to a sack based solder, not a, a bismuth base. And, and we'll reflow at a, at a temperature closer on it, not exactly as low as bismuth base, but closer. Does it use the same metals or is it the same metals in different percentages or is it a different uh, composition that well, allows it, it to it, it, reflow at a lower temperature? It uses a principle that um, I think some people aren't quite familiar with. Um, one of the ways I explain it is gold melts at a very high temperature. I can't exactly remember it, but it's about a thousand degrees C. Mm -hmm. But if I drop my wedding ring into a jar of mercury at room temperature, the mercury would dissolve the gold. Right. So what, what the folks at Indian uh, have done is they've, they've mixed a small amount of, of some other solders in with a sack solder and it enables it to melt at a relatively low temperature. But then when it freezes, it has more of the properties of sack and would only melt at a higher temperature. Right. And uh, it's pretty much, I think a new concept uh, in the industry and, uh, you know, uh, I think it's pretty exciting. I realize we're kind of going down a rabbit hole here, but just to finish the thought, the reason I asked that question about uh, a new technology having a knock-on effect of the yeah, effects yeah. Now, we now have to address, uh, one of the concerns I've always had with low-temperature solder, just from a principal standpoint, is we did a study with our uh, friends and colleagues at Foresight Analytical Laboratories in Kokomo, Indiana, mm -hmm. where we, we uh, ran a SAC uh, uh, material and uh, purposely reflowed the uh, or, or set the peak te reflow temperature 
about 5% lower than it should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, ran a bunch of boards at proper peak reflow temperature and, and then boards 2% lower, 4% lower, 5% lower. And when we got down to the 5% lower, we detected uh, sizable increases in contamination, you know, using mm. ion chromatography, localized extraction, ion chromatography, upwards of uh, 600 to 800% um, mm -hmm. increases in contamination under, under certain components, just as a result of a lower peak reflow temperature. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of makes sense if you think about it, because, you know, these were no clean fluxes and, and yeah, yeah, no clean relies on yeah. activation to burn out the activators mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, bad actors and make mm -hmm. them inert or as close to inert as possible. And when you don't hit that temperature, then these things are still in business. They're still activators, mm -hmm. right? And they're, and they're problematic. So what, one of the questions I've always had and, I don't expect it to be answered on this on this program, but one of the the reason the genesis for my question was, will we end up with low temperature solders that solve one problem, and and then we realize that well now you got to clean them <laughs> more vigorously because yeah. we're not activating all the all the bad actors. Yeah, that's one of the things, and you know I'm not being specific, but often we just we make changes for for reasons, and and we we. We get the good result we want, and then we find that there are unintended consequences. And I, I think you're saying that. And and I, I think the only way to determine that is do it and and run different tests to see uh, how things work out. But that's that's a really good point. And I, I think I made it earlier. If you're trying to minimize voiding, it may exacerbate some other uh, failure mechanism. And right. It, it's just impossible to have one set of materials and process equipment and process that eliminate all defects because some of them are mutually exclusive. Um, right. Like like a profile that's really good to minimize voiding, uh, in some cases can you can have longer time above liquidus that will exacerbate something like graping, which is a, a you know, a pho phenomena where uh, you get some oxidation of the solder powder. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's a balancing act. And our industry is, I've said this on the show before, our industry is notorious probably be the right adjective uh, for coming up with new uh, packages that are yes. are brilliant and and you know we can pack you know, qfns uh, bgas were the first example of that uh, brilliant new package where all your connections are at the bottom and, and you can pack a lot of technology into a relatively small footprint um, but then the industry says well how do we how do we solder these? You know, we, the, everything's at the yeah. bottom. We can't yeah. see it. And, and kind of the yeah. packaging people go, well, that's your problem. You know, and then we have several yeah, years yeah, right. of symposiums <laughs> where, we, where we teach our experience. And, and, and then someone says, well, how do we inspect them? And then you know, the x-ray people go, well, we have, we have a solution. But it, this industry is known to evolutionize, in some cases revolutionize, without an instruction manual. It's up to yeah. industry well, I, to kind I, I of figure even, it out. I was even thinking, you know, in the 90s, the 0402 passive was about the smallest. Then we went to the 0201, then the 01005, and I think we're even smaller than that now in some cases. And the people that invent these don't even think about the fact that they're going to be hard for people to assemble. And of course, they're they're desired because of density. You can get more into a smaller okay. space. But uh, And whenever the new ones have come out, like I remember when an 0201 came out, the solder paste inspection people that have like the laser scanners that, that look at the deposit of solder paste, they then had to scramble because they didn't have the optics capable of doing that small of a solder paste deposit. And then the O1005 and, and, you know, you're constantly having to uh, up your game essentially to, to keep up with some of the things invented by the folks that probably aren't worried too much about how hard it's going to be to assemble as you right. know. In my technical presentations i have a slide that i love to i've overused it i love to use this slide it shows a mom yelling at her young child you know, finger pointed bent over his head you know yelling at him and i said this is what happens when you don't tell your children you love them enough they either grow up to be serial killers and sociopaths or bottom terminated component designers <laughs> one of the two and um, you know to get yeah. back at society um yeah. so we talked earlier about uh uh, Phil Zaro and Jim Hall, and yep. uh, they're with a company called ITM. I think you have an association with ITM yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, ITM is a consulting company. Sure. Now, I define a consulting company. Some people think it's this is a like an insult. It's not actually. I think uh, you know. I, I define a consultant as someone you hire to tell you what time it is 
and the first thing the consultant asks you is, can I borrow your watch? And <laughs> meaning that the answers are there. The That's consultant not is not really just coming up abstractly with an answer. The answers yeah. are right there. Just your clients can't see it, right? That's, they don't know where to look. Very often the case. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so, um, how, how did you get involved in, in that part of the world, the consulting world? And, uh, are you still as deeply involved in it now, uh, with all the other activities that, that you have? Well, so, so I mentioned, I, I got laid off from Cookson and electronics right after nine 11. And it, it was kind of sad because the, the part of the company I was with Speedline electronics, their, their, their business was off 85%. That is not from X to 0.85 X. It was X to 0.15 X. So I, I decided that, that, um, I was going to see about consulting just with Indian corporations. So I had met uh, the president at some of the uh, SMTA conferences. And um, so I said, you know, I'd like to consult with you folks if you'd be interested. Um, I, I had been at IBM for quite a long time. So I had uh, an early retirement and I had medical benefits and everything. So I, I didn't need the benefits. So so they said, yeah, why don't we, why don't we talk about that? So that was 2002. And... Um, it's about 20 years ago now from, and I've been working with them ever since probably like one day a week. And that's, um, uh, it, at first it was a little more than that, but then right around the same time, um, I, I had worked with some professors at Dartmouth when my daughter went there and, and they knew that I was available and they asked me to teach a course the same year on optimizing manufacturing processes. And, um, so I started teaching that around the same time I was working in Indian corporation. Then, uh, the students seemed to like that course, so they asked me to teach another course and another course. And before you know it, I'm essentially full time at Dartmouth. Um, but even if a professor has a research program, uh, the university sort of ex really encourages you to consult because they want you to be up to speed on what's going out in the real world, so you can, you know, obviously teach your students that. So, in some respects, my research program—I I don't really have one. I'm. I'm uh, what's called an instructional professor at Dartmouth. I, I'm just responsible to teach courses. But in some respects, my research is, is done by working with engineers like it at Indian Corporation. Um, they're often doing interesting experiments and presenting um, the results to customers. And, and they're just too busy to write a paper. So I'll often get with them. And sometimes they'll just give me a PowerPoint presentation and I'll turn it into a paper and I'll learn from them. They'll learn a little bit from me and then we'll co-author papers at uh, SMTAI and SMT. Uh, a pan pack. And, and so I, I'm going to guesstimate I've written in the 20 years, probably 40 papers, maybe more with um, uh, folks from Indian Corporation. And there've been times too, when I've been uh, asked Phil Zaro if, and Jim Hall, if they'd like to participate. But one of the most rewarding, th rewarding things, and you alluded to this is often I will recruit a, a student at Dartmouth, um, it, more or less to alleviate a little bit of the writing for me, because they usually write really, really well. And, and I might give them the PowerPoint presentation and, and ask them to sort of make a draft and then I'll, I'll um, uh, work on it and, and then send it to the engineer at Indian Corporation that did the original work and, and make the student a co-author. And as, as you know, you had some on your uh, podcast, uh, some of the students from Dartmouth actually went to PanPAC a couple of times. And, you know, it's, it's just like super rewarding to help young people like that. And of course, when, when you go to a college in New England, going to SMTA PanPAC, in February is a big treat. <laughs> so, yes. And yeah. I believe in addition to uh, recruiting students to come to PanPAC and, and uh, deliver papers, I think this year your daughter was there, if memory serves. Is yeah, that correct? right. Who was an yeah. e endocrinologist, and she gave a fascinating keynote about, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. about COVID-19 and other you know, uh, major uh, outbreaks. Uh, it, sure. Yeah, yeah. And she did a great job of speaking to a group of non-medical doctors uh, about very complicated uh, issues. And um, mm -hmm. it, it was a it was a really good course, uh, by the way. It was it was a very good yeah, keynote. And yeah, uh, should be quite quite proud. Um, thank you. So, getting back to um, our next book, uh, which was written by. Um, uh, Phil uh, Zaro and Jim Hall, were you part of that uh, writing also? Um, no, or? no, but the, the reason I wanted to talk about it is uh, Phil and, and Jim, it's actually a compilation of all of the uh, 
excuse me, they have a, a it's, I guess it's like a podcast uh, called Board Talk. Yeah, before you and, go any further, let's yeah. let our audience hear just okay. a small clip of Board Talk for the maybe one or two, if any, people uh, in this it, audience yeah. that have never heard of Phil Zaro or Jim Hall. Um, they have a pretty unique style of, of providing highly technical information. Uh, it is almost uh, a comedian and a straight man, right? That yes. uh, Phil Zaro's a little on the goofy side uh, and, and Jim Hall is a little bit more of the straight, straight man role. Um, but um, together they make learning, um, learning um, uh, technical uh, best practices fun if you can if, yeah, you, sure. if you can imagine any version of fun in, in our world uh they our they world, do yeah, yeah. make it fun and a little bit goofy uh and memorable well they have a as you suggested they have a um it's kind of like a podcast that they do on on um i, I think it's a, a circuit technology or circuit yep. circuit technology circuit tech, yeah, circuit, yeah. circuit insight or something yeah and uh yeah. it's called board talk and for those npr fans who remember uh car talk um two guys from New England talking about uh, how to repair a car and all the problems that go on with your car. They kind of mimic that style. Uh, and uh, here's just a small 60-second uh, clip of the intro to the show and uh, the outro to their show. And welcome to Board Talk. This is Jim Hall and Phil Zaro, the Assembly Brothers. Pick and place, or place and pick. And we're here to answer your process questions regarding SMT in the associated realm. And we're coming today from our cave up high about Mount Rialto in the White Trash Mountains of New England. And uh, let's see, what's, what's today's question, Jim? What do we got? Question today comes from ER. Emergency room. Uh-oh. Uh, you have critical? mentioned about proper exhausting of the reflow oven. Hey, Phil, this is a repeat. This is a listener. Thank you, ER, for listening to us. We have stimulated your, uh, your thinking. I didn't know you um, can listen to this in the, in the emergency room, but that's pretty good. Okay. Um, at what exhaust pressure normally uh, should the oven be measured at? Oh, well, the only thing I could add to that is no matter how you're exhausting a your reflow oven. Don't solder like my brother. Don't solder like my brother. Don't solder like my brother. That's, uh, that's their trademark uh, goodbye on their show. So they have been doing this board talk show for years. And years. it looked like they took... Um, many if not all of the the q a that they've they, they've dealt with on the show and memorialized it in a book so yeah. what's your, what's your take on the book well uh, I, I would say that i i did not do any of the writing of the book but i i think the thing i did do and i'll be interested to hear it's phil and jim because i'm sure they're going to watch this because i mentioned i was doing this i think i harassed phil especially for quite a long time i said there is no place in the world where you can get this kind of information. There aren't books that talk about, you know, a question like was asked by that 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 person. I mean, it's, it's not really defects. It's like pretty much how to do things. And you guys have done a couple hundred of these. Why don't you put it into a book with an index so people can pick it up and and and, and read it and, and learn how to, all these different things like, you know, worrying about components falling off on the, on the bottom of a circuit board um, when you're going through wave soldering or something like that and um uh or if it's even smt and you flip it over will it will the solder uh the liquid solder will it will it still hold the component and, and sort of rules of thumb for that and um i think it was a couple of years i kind of bugged phil mainly so he finally said you know i'm going to do it and so i said well let me write the intro to it so i did write i did write the the foreword or something like that to it but i i think it's really an invaluable source of information because uh, again, there there is no book like the SMTA um, uh, certification book that teaches you how to be a process engineer. This book teaches you the everyday little details that really are really really important. That you know there are just so many of them, and and I, I just think it's an invaluable contribution to electronics assembly. Is there an anecdote from the book that that uh, is memorable for you? Is there one f story that is funny or insightful that that stands out i i, I think there's a practical one that, that i just mentioned it you know people wrote in i'm doing double-sided smt and i'm going to flip the board over and i've already i've already put components on the bottom uh 
how can I be assured that the component won't fall out? And, and they talk about uh, the amount of weight you can have per the area of the, um, the pad. And, and there's a rule of thumb for this. And, and I don't know where else you could easily find that. And, and what you find is the both of them, the combined knowledge they have, practical stuff like this, I don't know is, is equal anywhere else in the industry. It's just, you know, they've just have decades of knowledge that, and a lot of little details like this that you can't, um, you can't replace. And, and I have to agree too, Phil is just hilarious. He, he could be a stand-up com comedian and, and he is the, the comic and Jim is the straight, straight man. It really makes it a lot of fun. I, I'm sure the whole thing where in this, what we heard where uh, the person's initials were ER, I'd almost guarantee you that that wasn't rehearsed. So I think they told me they never rehearsed. Phil is yeah. just so quick. He's got things like that. And, yeah. you know, it keeps it fun and light. So. Yeah. I, I did some uh, producing for them um, to digitize one of their training courses and, and make it available. And I had both um, Phil and Jim virtually, you know, on a, on a recording session where they were recording their bits. And, and it was just funny to, even though they weren't, I didn't physically, I wasn't physically in their presence, but I could see them and I could hear them. And it was just funny to see, you know, Jim's eye rolling when Phil goes off on his goofy, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. tangents. Yeah. And, and I, obviously they work well together. Um, oh, and yeah. they probably also drive each other a little bit crazy. You know, it's, it's, it's just a, <laughs> it's a yin and a yang, but it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't blend, but it, it coexists and it's successful yeah, yeah. because yeah. our industry, you know, you face it, our industry is filled with exceptionally intelligent people. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, obviously you know this as a professor, it's one thing to have the knowledge. It's another thing to open the vault door and let that knowledge get sure. out in a manner that can sure. be received. And you know, I, I've talked with a lot of you know very bright people at you know through this show um, and, and other and other um, um, venues. And sometimes it's really difficult to get that information out. You know, it's there. Yeah. They can do yeah. it, but trying to get it out in a manner that can be digested and understood and received by sure, people is sure. that's a gift in itself. So, and, yep. and many people that possess the intelligence level don't always possess the other side of that. Right. right? So yeah. we, uh, we they, all know geniuses that it's just really hard for them to share their, their knowledge in a way that others can, can benefit from it. Sure. You know, they thought Einstein needed to go to a special school. They thought he had some right, IQ right, issues. Right, it turned out right. he, he was so bright. You know, he, he was, yeah. you know, borderline, um, uh, uh, borderline judge to be just the opposite of that, sure. you know? So it's, sure. Sure. it is, um, it, it is a, a fine line between, you know, brilliance and, and being able to communicate with the world and function in the world. Um, and sure. not everyone has sure. that. You know, our industry is, is no exception. Uh, any technologically based industry is no exception. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about my, um, personally, my favorite of, of the books that I, I kind of reviewed uh, of yours, The Adventures yeah. of Patty and the Professor. Well, obviously, it's no secret who the professor is. That's yourself. Um, tell me about this, this particular book. Uh, first, before we get into what it's about, what was the inspiration of a book like this? Well, uh, yeah, it, 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 it does require a little explanation. I believe that I am the first blogger in uh, SMT. I started blogging um, Indium Corporation's Rick Short asked me to do it. And so I started blogging a couple posts a month. And it was, it was pretty much the kind of thing that, you know, if you've got this problem, do this to solve it. And, and I did that for uh, three or four years. And occasionally I could uh, include some, you know, personal fun type things. And then around 2000, maybe eight or nine, I thought this is getting kind of boring. I said, why don't I invent a character, Patty, who is a superstar young gal engineer. And we're going to talk about her having some of the things that I observed in my consulting and helping people with, with problems. And so uh, I did that. Uh, I would have to say though, the professor isn't really me. I don't know if you can see this. Um, I'll open the first page and I'll show you what a, a line drawing of the professor. See if this will work. Whoops. Whoops. I'm going the wrong way. Oh, other way. Other way. Other way. Other there way. you go. Other it's way. coming. Keep going. Keep going. Tell Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. There's Patty and there's 
that looks more like Bob Willis than okay. it does yourself. <laughs> so I, I say you can clearly tell it's not me because he's more handsome. Uh, so, so, um, and, and I, I thought it was only going to be four posts because I had a story I so wanted to tell because it was so dramatic. And, and a number of people, um, when I gave them a copy of the book, I said, read just the first eight pages. It's four posts about something that really happened. And one of my colleagues said, you know, it was really fun to read, but it's, it's, it just, he, he didn't, he didn't read where I said it really happened. He said, you know, nobody could be that bad. And so, so then when I finished that, I thought, well, I got another idea. And then I got another idea. And, and for the most part, every post is, is at least 70% based on fact. The other thing that was kind of fun is uh, I made Patty kind of have a life and, and we got to know her pretty well. So she was a, a, a hopelessly amazing young woman. And I thought, hey, if I want to develop the characters and I want to have characters that are like superstars, you know, don't be angry with me. So she speaks four languages and, you know, she just always does the right thing. And her boyfriend is amazing. And, and we even go through her getting engaged and then her getting married. So the stories would be 30 percent about Patty's life. She's also a good enough female golfer that um, she was thinking of being a pro, but she decided that, you know, it's kind of risky. So she'd become an engineer instead. But she's a so, she's real in in the in the way that people are real in that she's not too sure of herself. She has some self yeah, doubt. Um, yeah. When she was faced with a male counterpart who was, you know, consuming all the oxygen in the room, so to speak, yeah. and convinced that he couldn't be wrong, she her tendency was to question herself uh, more yeah. than anything else yeah. and rely on other experts. So. Um, you, you were able to, um, capture kind of a, a real human personality in Patty. Yeah. And I, and I tried to make it fun. It was kind of rewarding when somebody sent me an email. There's also a, a guy she worked with who was called Pete, who was a little older than her, but, um, not a senior in the company. And, and they would often go out solving problems together. And, and, and somebody sent me an email. Could we have more stories about Patty and Pete? I especially like Pete. <laughs> That's funny. And, yeah. and you, know, you, you kind of get a kick out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when, when you run out of technical things to say, you'll just have to write a romantic comedy about them because we yeah. all want to know what happens to them. So let's talk about the first, uh, you know, the first eight pages, the, the story, which was based on a true story, um, yep. even though the, the names of the, of the innocent or guilty have been changed and, and you, you took some liberties with, uh, you know, their, their life in general, but the, but the technical challenge was the same. So this was a factory where the professor uh, went in and kind of to do an audit uh, if, if for lack of a better word and uh, the first one of the first things the professor asks one of the uh, uh, I think the production manager or something was you know what's your uh, pick and places machines uptime uh, average uptime and uh, that person said not quite off the cuff, but they said, yeah, we've done some calculations and we're, we think we're at 95%. And the professor then said, okay, let me do some studies and, you know, I'll, I'll get back with you. And, and more studies were done and, and uh, the actual percentage was, uh, remind me what it was, it was something like 10 or 12% 10%, or something. 10%. 10%. Yeah. So they thought they were at 95% uptime, 5% <laughs> downtime, and it turned out to be 90% downtime, 10% uptime. Um, that is a huge gap yep. in reality versus uh, uh, expectation. Uh, where did that story come from? Not, not who, but you know, what, yeah, what was yeah. the genesis well, of that story? I, and, and how could, is it that common for people within a manufacturing environment to really be off that much? Yeah, so, so uh, it's absolutely a real story. Obviously, I won't mention the company. It's a, it's a long enough time to go. There's, there's no way you could read the story and know who the company was. But what happened is uh, one of the young engineers at the company was in one of my workshops and uh, they had two assembly lines and they, they were fortunate. They had a captured business. They were assembling for uh, the parent. And so uh, they, their business was so brisk, they had two assembly lines and they just couldn't manufacture enough. So the boss said, well, why don't we build another assembly line? So the young engineer said, well, why don't we invite, I think, you know, most people call me Dr. Ron. Why don't we invite Dr. Ron to come and maybe he can help us with our productivity and we won't have to build another line. So I came and I asked a few questions, as you alluded to, 
uh, I first ask them, you know, what do you think your uptime is, which is essentially the amount of time that the line is running as a fraction of all available time. And, uh, you know, they hemmed and hawed a little bit. They said, well, we think about 95%. So I asked them a few metrics, like how many boards to produce a month, this and that. So I, I had to put together a little Excel spreadsheet. And I said, well, from what you told me, your uptime is about 10%. And the manager it is one of the more awkward experiences I've ever had in my life. The manager got like red in the face and, and actually started shaking. And he, he wanted to have the young engineer escort me from the building. I mean, it was really kind of upsetting. And so, so I said, well, don't get the angry ultimate with shoot me. the Maybe. messenger, right? Yeah. I said, don't get angry with me. Maybe I made a mistake. I said, why don't we measure the yuck time for two weeks and I'll come back in like, you know, two weeks and a couple days and, and we'll see what we can do. So the, the boss calmed down and it just worked out perfectly. They had five process engineers and what they agreed to do was every half hour they would go out and in an Excel spreadsheet, they would have a cell. And if the line was running, they'd put a one. And if the line wasn't running, they'd put a zero and they do this for two weeks. And, and I would come back in, you know, like two and a half weeks. And so they did that. And so uh, the people doing it kind of kept it secret and, and they didn't really reveal it until I got there. And I was wrong. It was not 10%. It was 9.7%. And, and so now the, the boss is more embarrassed than anything. And the, the, the thing, if you ask me that I'm most passionate about is, most engineers and most managers will be working on the head and pillow defect, voiding, whatever. They have no concept for how little time their line is running. And nobody seems to care about it. And it's shocking because one of the uh, comparisons I, I learned is, you know, let's say the government called Mike Conrad up and said, you know, Mike, we really need to get some more cash out in the world. And in Congress, somehow people think you're a really nice guy. We're going to give you a couple of money printing machines and the paper and ink. And you can print as many hundreds as you want. It's not going to be legal. And would you have those those printers running 10% of the time? And so, so what I found is um, they actually did some things really well. Like uh, they were a high mix, low volume, um, or I'm sorry, a yeah, high mix line where they, they had low, low volume runs and a lot of different runs. So they did a lot of setups and they were pretty good in that they had whiteboards near each of the two lines where they'd say that they were getting the material for the for the next job that was coming and even the job after that. So that was all good. But one of the things they didn't do is they didn't use feeder racks. So every time they changed a line, it took them two and a half hours to get all of the new reels on the pick and place machines. I love the reason they didn't use feeder racks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you so, have to share so, that. This is, all this is, this is part of the consultant borrowing the watch, right? Yeah, the answer yeah. so, was so, quite literally on the floor. So, so I said to him, I said, you know, I, I know feeder racks are expensive, but I, I can show you that if you get, you know, you, you spend the, whatever it is, $80,000 to get more feeder racks. So you can, you can have the, the job running next. You have the reels already on the feeder racks and you just run, run over and click them into the pick and place machine. And, and somebody said, we have feeder racks. And I said, why don't you use them? And, and I'm standing right next to the pick and place machine. I said, we well, can't you see the rug? The rug is torn and curled up and the feeder racks stick on the rug. And what was a, almost sad to me is that someone can't realize that the benefit of saving two and a half hours amount of time every time they do a chain, changeover is just horrendous in the amount of money it will save you, the amount of productivity. So I said, well, you know, let's get... Um, uh, you know, something like a box cutter and cut where the rugs frayed away. And, and, and then the, the manager was really embarrassed. He was kind of angry with the process engineers because I think they decided not to use the feeder racks and never told them. So, so we got that solved. And then I had, I had been there for, uh, you know, quite a few days now watching things. And, and I said, well, uh, lunch kills you. And, and they said, why? And I said, because you're down so long for lunch. And they said, well, what are you talking about? Lunch is only half an hour. And I said, it may only be half an hour, but your line is down for 90 minutes. And again, they got a little angry. And I said, well, don't say anything. Let's just watch what happens. Well, let's say lunchtime is at noon. Well, they wanted to make sure the line was shut down before lunch. So they shut it down at 1145. And then lunch wasn't really a half an hour. It started at noon. It was really 40 minutes. And then by the time they got the line up and running again, it was, it was essentially 
quarter after one. So the line was down for an hour and a half. Which is like 25% of their production day, if you think yeah, about it, right? Yeah. Especially when you think about it, when you're only up 10% in an eight hour day, that's, you're only running 0.8 <laughs> hours. You know, I mean, just, just if you could do something about lunch, you double it. So I, I said, why don't you work out something where you can have the line running over lunch, like a skeleton crew or something. And, and they, they hummed and hawed and everything. They said, we can't do that. And I said, why not? I said, or I said, why can't you do that? And they, they said, well, because the operators are all friends. And they want to eat lunch together. And I said, how much do they get paid per hour? And this was quite a while ago. It would be more now. And I remember it was $10 an hour. So this is a long enough time ago. They'd probably be $20 an hour or 18. So I said, you can give everybody a $2 an hour raise and you'll make more money if they can figure out a way to keep the line running over lunch. And this is again where the, the boss got angry with me. You just mean $2 raise just over lunchtime, don't you? And I said, no, a two hour, $2 an hour raise for a 40 hour week. And he said, that's impossible. I just can't believe this. So I showed him, I said, well, if, if we have the line running over lunch, that's 90 minutes you're not losing. It, it literally doubles your uptime, even if you don't use the feeder racks. And I, so I did some calculations. You're going to not, not only do you not need to buy another line, you probably will have some time when one of the lines won't be running. So they, they worked out a way that um, once a week, uh, if you're an operator, you had to stay back for the lunch and you had to run around hopping a bit for 40 minutes while the people were, were eating lunch. And then you only had to do that once a week though, because uh, it's, let's say your day is Wednesday. On Thursday, it's your name's Mary. It's Charlie, and on on Friday, it's you know Pete, and on Monday, it's Sally. So it's only one day a week, and you get a twenty percent raise. And and the, the, the whole since this time, I have made almost an evangelism like effort to try to convince people the importance of uptime. And if you ask me, the most frustrating thing in our world is. I can't get anybody to be excited about it. If I give a talk on productivity or a workshop, no one will attend. If I give a talk on how to minimize voiding or the head and pillow defect or graping, it'll be packed. But if I give one on productivity and I can show you how to essentially double your profits, nobody will come. And so, you know, I interviewed I just kind of shake my head. a year or so ago, I interviewed um, a production manager from Matrix Group named Patrick Stimpert. And yeah. He is an automation and optimization and efficiency guru. Uh, he, he gives an example of if you're left-handed, keep your pencil on the left-hand side of your desk because the time it takes to, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, obviously that that's, like that's the, a bit of an exaggeration, yeah. but that's, that's kind of his mantra. He, he's, yeah. he designed his production line in a figure eight not a yeah. linear line because he has uh, goods in coming in one end of the building, goods out coming in another end of yeah. the building. And he designed all his um, bins and stock, you know, shelves and stuff like that to be right near where they are. They pull them right where they use them, uh, which required this kind of section, this uh, eight shaped um, production line. Uh, and his, his claim was that, you know, we talked about U S competitiveness in assembly mm -hmm. compared to uh, offshore. And his mm -hmm. claim was, it's not labor, it's automation. If we were highly automated and efficient, there's no country we could not compete against because Absolutely automation true. costs the same in China or Vietnam yeah. or Mexico as it does here, right? So, it, and if you can minimize the labor, I'm not talking about lights out factory. I think that's a no. little bit of a dream. You don't have to minimize it that much. Um, you don't have to minimize it that much, but you just have to be extremely efficient. And automation, contrary to popular belief, is not the elimination of people. It it just it still requires people. Someone has to feed the feeder, you know, and 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 set up the machines. Um, but it it's all about efficiency and optimization, and and that we can compete with anybody if it's highly automated. Um, yeah. I, I I like to Absolutely. compare uptime on a pick and place machine to the airline industry. So Southwest Airlines, you know, which is known to turn planes in 20 minutes at the mm -hmm. gate, you know, they realized, I, I heard a speech by their CEO a few years ago, and they were asked, you know, why do you not charge for bags? Like every airline charges to check your bags. And, you know, aren't you leaving some substantial revenue, you know, uh, on, on the ground? 
And they said, absolutely not. They did a study that uh, if you were to charge for check bags, what do people do? They drag their bags on the plane to the point where, you know, after two thirds of the people have boarded the plane, they have to gate check bags. That oh, gate checking man. bags takes time. And, yeah. and, they, and, and, they, and they don't charge for that. So and they don't free, charge right? for that anyway. Yeah. It's not like it's revenue. Interesting. So the yeah. amount of money that they would make, the amount of revenue they would make checking bags um, is much less than the amount of revenue they make by getting their plane in the air faster. Because they said, you know, 100% of their airplanes are leased, not purchased, they're leased. So mm -hmm. 24 hours a day, every minute of 24 hours a day, they're paying for that plane, but they're only getting revenue for that plane when the wheels mm -hmm. are up. When the wheels Isn't are down, it costs them. When yeah, the wheels are up, they make money. Yeah. So they need that plane to be wheels up more, just like this pick and place machine. 10% doesn't make them any money. Um, they need something close to 30, 35% to be mm -hmm. highly efficient. Yep. Yep. Same thing. So it, it, if people can view reflow ovens and pick and place machines and all the various uh, processes in, a, in an SMT assembly line or an assembly line in general, uh, like the airline industry does, at least the yeah. discount carriers, um, then they could realize that they're only making money when it's producing product for their customers. It's costing yeah. them money otherwise. And that, that's so that's so interesting because, I, and I, I, I didn't mention this, I developed uh, some cost estimating software for electronics assembly. And, it, and when, I, when I give workshops on that, I show that if, if China pays China wages and we pay US wages, and we're even like five or 10% more efficient, we're gonna, we're gonna kill them because uh, productivity is, is so important in your profitability. And, and I, I think that's what the same thing the Southwest is saying. That's so amazing that they, <laughs> they figured that out and their competitors haven't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They're all still trying to nickel and dime the customer as opposed yeah, yeah. to- um... And, and they, they count the nickels and dimes and makes it look like a lot, but then they don't count what they lose that's right. In all that you just said, gate checking and all that kind of stuff. That's right. That's yeah, a typical airline has an hour at the gate, and you know Southwest yeah, is like yeah. twenty minutes. And obviously, yeah. Southwest makes money. Um, yep. I also use Southwest uh, to my team as an example of, of exceeding expectations. And I always remind my my team, you know, what airline consistently for decades has had the highest satisfaction level of any airline, and people will say, you know, British Airways or Virgin or whatever. They're like, no, it's Southwest. Southwest, they have. Terrible service. Like, no, they just don't overpromise. Your expectation yeah. when you get on a Southwest flight is that they will take you from A to B relatively on time. They probably won't kill you and they might throw a peanut yeah. at you, right? Yeah. I mean, that's it. You'll never yeah, complain yeah. you had a bad meal on Southwest because they don't serve meals on Southwest. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. their expectation is low and they deliver yeah. based yeah. on the expectation. So, sure. you know, if you set the expectation really high and then you deliver a crappy meal, people are going to complain that the, sure. you know, the Wi-Fi on the plane was too slow as opposed yeah, yeah. to Southwest, which doesn't promise anything except they'll get you there. Right. Um, so same, same thing. Changing subjects a little bit as we kind of wrap up. Um, recently, you invited me to kind of be an evaluator, a judge, so to speak, on, mm -hmm. on um, some of your students' uh, innovations course presentation. So you deal with engineering students, obviously. Uh, and this was a, an innovations course, which warmed my heart because I love to see some degree of business incorporated and fused into engineering because a lot of these young graduating students will become entrepreneurs themselves. And, yep. and if they're just too techy, if all they have is the, the, the tech mentality, um, they may not be able to exploit their, their knowledge and their gift of, of technical uh, to the greatest extent they could. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I, I love that program of not just, um, not just teaching the technical, but you know, how to earn money, how to do seed rounds, how to, how to um, prepare a business um, a proposition sure. and, and things like that. So um, tell me a little bit about, uh, more about that program. I think you took over that program from another professor who was a guest on my show. Well, yeah. I, I took over the course. The course, um, okay. Yeah, so, so let me talk a, a bit about the program. Um, a number of professors uh, at Dartmouth noticed, I'm gonna say it's probably 10 years ago or so, that uh, there are a lot of PhD students and, and maybe even some other engineering students that, that have really good ideas uh, in their research and, and, and have discovered some things that could be turned into a product, 
but not very many of them succeed. And so the professors decided to develop a, a PhD innovation program. So if you come to Dartmouth and, and are part of this program, you still have to do PhD type research. Uh, so you may be working on something in biomedical or, or something like that. You come up with a, a product or a process. You still have to do that and get a regular PhD. But you also can take some courses and, and uh, get accreditation in the innovation program. And in, in a simplistic way, it, it helps you to learn how to develop a startup. And so the course I teach is about that. And that's a course you lectured in. Uh, and, and one of the founders of this is Professor Eric Fossum, who you've had on your on your podcast here. The uh, uh, inventor of the CMOS, CMOS image sensor, just to yes, yes, put yes. a bow on, on him. Yeah. And, and so um, he was just really overtapped with teaching courses and doing a lot of the wonderful things he does at the engineering school, helping the dean and everything. So I, I volunteered to teach the course. I've never really done a startup myself, but I've worked with a lot of people that have, and and, and I, I felt that I could, uh, I could handle it. So it's really been a lot of fun because we've had a lot of speakers like you. And, and I mentioned this fellow, Ron Adler, who I thought was amazing. Uh, one of the uh, professors in the Tuck Business School at Dartmouth. So it, it's really been a lot of fun. And, you know, whenever you teach, um, you probably learn more than the students do. <laughs> Uh, for sure. You know, I, I think I learned, I knew 60% of the material before I went into teaching the course, but not 100%. And you always get a fresh perspective when you have speakers like you and some of the other speakers. So uh, it, it's, it was just really, really great. And I think the students probably appreciated the most having speakers like you, but people that have actually done it. And uh, as you said earlier, uh, you know, talking about your mistakes, uh, I think is as valuable as anything. So uh, we think we're doing pretty well. You know, uh, a number of our students have started companies. And actually, I had one of this one of the gals in that just graduated probably three or four years ago, and she's already already got a startup going. And she came in and talked about that. So the students really uh, benefit a lot from that. Yeah, I was impressed listening to the um, their business proposals, and you know, a couple points I was critical, but not because the proposals were bad just because mm -hmm. I wanted to provide some constructive criticism, you know, even yeah. if it was petty, you know, it, it yeah. was. Um, but yeah, I, I guess we didn't, we didn't mention to the viewers that um, part of the course is the students, you know, have to not take tests, but they have to write some papers and whatever. But an important part of it is, is they break up into teams. I had um, about 20 some students. So they broke up into five teams and each of them uh, had a product that they were going to tell how they were going to uh, develop a startup. And, you know, they're going to have to have a business plan and, you know, how much money they're going to need and all that. And, and so that's what Mike was one of the evaluators. And I had a, a handful of other people that were speakers in the class. One of the uh, uh, folks that, that we got to um, uh, actually critique one of the presentations uh, earlier in the course was a venture capital company. And, of course, part of the course is how do you present to a venture capital group? So I've been working with some venture capital folks on another another project. And I said, would you be willing to, we'll, we'll get one of our teams to present to you. And we just flipped the dice to determine which team it was going to be. And would you critique it just like you would a normal uh, venture uh, thing? And, and not only do students get a lot out of that, they've now made some contacts with these people. And as you know, a, an awful lot of life is having a good attitude and meeting a lot of people. You think about this, and this is why I'm so troubled about Zoom because so many people now are not going to have in-person meetings because Zoom works actually pretty well, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. But just think if if the conference in Hawaii that you and I met at was a Zoom meeting, we would have never met each other. That's and right. I think both of us have had you know, a pretty rich amount of uh, relations because of that sure. chance meeting at breakfast. And uh, it, I, I think it's kind of sad. And I'm I'm a, a, a real, uh, now that COVID is, is hopefully, you know, way down in the concern list. Uh, I want to be back in the classroom with the students. I want to have as many in-person meetings as possible. I try to take students to lunches, as I think you've been to uh, uh, one or two of the lunches with me, and mm -hmm. you've taken some students uh, after the class for uh, uh, some discussions. You can't replace how important that is. And if we ever get too much replacing it with Zoom, I think it's really going to hurt us. I totally agree. There's Zoom was a good substitute for yeah. no meetings at all. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, it, it's Pandora's box. And, and yeah. you know, the 
it, it, it's, um, it's hard to put back in. And a lot of bean counters at companies now will say, well, we survived for two years without travel. Let's yeah, just let's keep going. More. Right. <laughs> but you save so many millions of dollars, right? Right. And I think there's, there's a time when that's appropriate. You know, I'm on the board yeah. of the SMTA and we have lots of meetings and, and probably most of those are just as well virtual because we can have, yeah, we have yeah. the ability to meet more often when we can do a virtual mm-hmm. meeting. Yep. But yep. the uh, three or four other meetings that we do in person every year are, are vital yep. because you could just get the feedback. You can see the body language. You, you, you know, it's, there's nuances. There's the, the breakfast line where I look back and yeah, see yeah, you yeah, standing yeah, 20 minutes yeah. behind me. And it's sure. like, sure. and so much, I was just at the SMTA leadership forum and I was speaking on networking and, and I actually told our story of how, mm-hmm. you know, we met at breakfast and then next thing you know, I'm speaking sure. at Dartmouth and, and, and we're doing shows together and, you know, all this stuff. And, th- and that, you know, that just kind of shows the power of networking and, and you, mm-hmm. one never sure. knows, you know, that seven degrees of separation gets, gets moved down to, yeah. you know, yeah. one or two when sure. we're face to face because there's just, yep. and that's, that's subconscious networking. You know, I didn't sure. have a master plan. It wasn't a diabolical plan. I'm going right. to get Ron. I'm going to get in front of him in line. I'm going to exploit sure, the yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Imagine the power of, of a proactive conscious networking, you know, if actually yeah, people yeah, right. wanted absolutely. to yeah. mix and mingle yeah. and, and, you know, for some sure. gain, uh, how much uh, people can get ahead. But mm-hmm. anyway, good job on, on the books. Um, any more books in the works? Um, well, I've actually, uh, maybe not a book, but um, so Patty and the professor kind of went quiet and every now and then I'd, I'd make another episode, but um, the, the people at iConnect ask if I might want to do something. So now I have one of Patty's students, Maggie Benson and her fiance, uh, Maggie's grandfather wanted to retire and he had a small assembly company, a uh, short drive from where Patty um, is now a professor. The, the professor helped her get a professorship at, at um, comically Ivy University which is uh, could be noticed as Dartmouth by some of the restaurants that I talk about them eating in. But anyway, uh, Maggie, I'm on episode 13. I do one a month and it talks about her taking over her grandfather's company and, 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 you know, putting lean uh, principles in and, and increasing uptime was a major thing. And uh, so if you just type in uh, Maggie Benson, Ron Lasky, I connect, you, you should be able to get to the episodes. And, and again, it's a, a fun type thing. It's 60 to 70% of practical, how you improve things, but, 30 to 40 percent of Maggie getting engaged to her boyfriend and the same time that her grandfather gives her the company and some of the challenges they have with some of the people and they buy another company and the guy that sells it to them is cranky guy that hates the workers and that kind of stuff so you know and, and I try to be in all of these at the end upbeat with the belief yeah. that I think that for basically most people are trying to do the right thing and if you work hard and you're kind to other people and everything that the world will bless you back if you do that. And that's absolutely. sort of the spirit in which I write these. Pay it forward. Absolutely. So the, your yeah, book, right. uh, The Printed Circuit Assembler's Guide to Solder Defects, is that published by iConnect or is that uh, Indium? Yeah, available? yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, 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 I think you can get it on the Indium website, but it's, it's uh, uh, iConnect actually helped Indium Corporation put it together. And there's a soft copy, but I think if you do a little web searching, they also sell it for a nominal price, I think like 10 bucks if you want to get a hard copy. Okay. And if if anybody if anybody wants a Patty and the Professor book, you can get the soft copy. But if you want a hard copy, I've got a few, or a hard copy of the Defects book. If you get one, if you tell me, I'll autograph either one for you. Well, you heard it here first. You heard it here okay. first. If you want Dr. Ron to, uh, um, AKA the Professor, even though he's yeah. technically not the Professor in the book, I think I think his alter ego is certainly in there, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, if you want a signed copy of that, uh, I will uh, put you in I, touch with I'd like with to one. close with one other thing. Um, you saw how passionate I am about productivity. So if any of the listeners out there have any questions about it, would like to talk to me about it, um, I, I'd be thrilled to try to help you because it's so important and it seems to be neglected by quite a few folks. Very good. Well, we'll have Dr. Ron's contact information in the show notes again, if you're on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Click down there. It says show more. We'll have uh, his contact information there. And um, if you're listening to this in the car, on the treadmill, wherever you listen to your podcasts, um, uh, just look at the show notes on the uh, podcast app that you're on. And uh, you'll be able to see information on how to download the books and uh, how to get in touch with uh, Dr. Ron. Um, 
thank you so much for thank being you. my guest it's today. Fun. It's always good to see you. Um, if here. not in person, this is a good second choice. Yeah, sure. And sure. Uh, I'll look forward to um, talking to you again and in, in probably the near future. Sure. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and so many more. Also, be sure to check out my other podcasts, including the Concept to Creation podcast, where I feature conversations with entrepreneurs within the electronic assembly space, and the Innovations and Technology podcast, where we discuss innovative products within our industry. All three shows are also available in video format. Check out the Reliability Matters or Concept to Creation or Innovations in Technology podcasts on YouTube. Just search the show's name and you can find all three shows. Or go to MikeConrad.com. That's Conrad with the K. All three shows also appear there. Again, thanks for being part of my podcast family. I appreciate you being here. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy. And of course, keep doing it right. See you again soon. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.